Steve Fender. I'm from Fender's Fish Hatchery. We're located here in Ohio. And we've done a number of, number of videos over the years that pertain to pond management, pond stocking, fish management, vegetation control, and aeration. This particular video, I want to talk about aeration. And just to give you an idea where we're at, we're in Jim Fatera's shop. Jim does these expos where he takes a big tank, fills it up with water, it's a great big aquarium, they stand up on top of it and they do fishing expos. You can check out the truck he's got here. It's all colored up and it's got sponsorship on it and the tanks that go with it. And these big tanks, he sets them up stationary in a building, fills them up with water, puts fish in them, and they do fishing demonstrations and stuff. So Jim's been very gracious enough to let us use his facility to show the actual aeration, the way the bubbles will move the water as the aeration works. So today we're gonna to talk about surface aeration and bottom aeration. We're gonna go over on the other side and I'm gonna show you a tank that he just recently is painted and, and redoing it to keep it looking good and functioning well for the different shows. So let's go over to the other side. This is the side of Jim's shop that he's doing his, his assembly and his maintenance on his tank. So you see this is a, a freshly painted tank. It's an old tank that they've repainted. He's just putting the glass back in and they're cleaning everything up, doing the rewiring on it. And they fill it up with water and get it ready to go before they take it to the next show to make sure when they show up, they put water in it, it doesn't leak all over the floor and they, they make a mess. So we're going to go back and want to set up some of the aeration and explain to you a little bit more on aeration. Okay, we've got two different types of aeration we typically work with. We have surface aeration and bottom aeration. And that pretty much speaks, speaks for itself as far as what the two do. When you have bottom aeration, it's typically always an air stone like you see in the bottom of this tank here. That you push air down through an air line from an air source that pushes air into that air stone and breaks it up in a fine mist of bubbles and travels to the surface. Or you have the, the surface aeration like this, which is typically a float with a pump hanging off of it. And that pump pulls the water in, shoots the water up through a nozzle and it changes different types of spray patterns that give you a different effect. As you can see, this is working off the, the lower, the upper couple feet of water. And if you have a, a body of water that's more than seven or eight feet deep or even six feet deep, it really isn't going to do a whole lot for the bottom of the pond. It's just going to work on the surface. So while it does do a good job of keeping the fish alive through the winter, it really doesn't do anything for these old ponds that get stagnant in the bottom, the, down in the bottom when it gets real hot and you get that stratification and such. I'm going to plug a pump in and so we can see just what the bubbles do. As you can see now, we're pushing about 5 CFM and 5 cubic feet per minute, and it pushes as air, air comes out and the fine mist of bubbles travel to the surface. As you can see, it's moving water. So, what this does for you, if you have a pond that's 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 feet deep, and, and by the way, I try to make sure my customers don't put it any deeper than about 12 foot of water. For one, it makes the pump work much harder as you go deeper because of pressure, and the other is if you have a pond that's particularly deep and has a lot of dead water in the bottom, you don't want to bring it up too quickly where you can cause a turnover. So you want to set these pumps up somewhere about, the stones set them up somewhere at about six, seven, eight, nine feet of water. Eight to 10 is just ideal. So no deeper than 10 feet of water. If you got one that's very shallow, obviously you're gonna to have to go in shallower water, but typically eight to 10 feet is a good location. And you see as those bubbles come up, it's making a current. You can see the water's turbulent and moving. What that does for you is, is if you have a pond that's stratified and it breaks that stratification up, or if you have it in early enough in the season, it eliminates the possibility for stratification altogether. What that means is, as is your fish manure, your vegetation goes to the bottom, all that black, mucky stuff at the bottom produces fertility, which makes algae blooms, which blocks the sunlight, which if there's no sunlight, there's no photosynthesis, and also the water stays real cold. It'll, break, it'll make a stratified level down there, it'll trap all these gases in. When you have variation going on like that, that prevents that stratification from happening, so you're gonna keep that pond from becoming stagnant, and also as these bubbles travel to the surface, they pick up gases from the decaying plant matter to the fish and water and bring it to the surface and release them into the air. So what we've seen so far, what this bottom aeration is gonna do for you, it's gonna de-stratify, it's gonna put more oxygen in your water, it's also going to knock the gases out that are causing the bad algae blooms that cause stratification. So that's the advantage of using bottom aeration. Now, bottom aeration obviously needs say needs some sort of a, a air source. The one we have running right now is this is a Thomas air compressor. I'm going to shut it off now. Shut the noise down a little bit. They're not terribly noisy. 
But the Thomas Air Compressor is a very commonly used compressor in the aeration industry. These units we sell, we sell new ones and used ones. I like the used ones because I have a company that rebuilt some for me, gives you a one year warranty, and these things will run for years and years and years. The electric motor in these things will just run for practically forever. The three buildable parts are inside. There's a, there's a little piston type setup in here that's got an O-ring in it and it's got some reeds in it. So for about 25 bucks, you can rebuild these little units. Now, what I suggest to my customers, they set these things on a timer, run them for two, three hours a day. Cuts down electric usage and also keeps the pump so it works longer. Now, another type of system we've got here is, is a, an outfit from a company called High Blow. This is a company I recently started dealing with. What I like about them, this is a diaphragm type compressor. Now the advantage of a diaphragm compressor versus a piston type is less moving parts. So with this you have a diaphragm in there that's moved back and forth with a little plate electronically. And it's a diaphragm about this big round has a couple check valves in it. These, this company has taken these things, put them in freezers and froze them and kicked them on to make sure that they will operate in real, real cold temperatures. So I like this particular diaphragm pump because it will work in cold, extreme cold temperatures and it will also work in deeper water. Now I still don't want to see them the stone any deeper than about 8 to 10 feet of water, but these will work down in that 8 to, 8, 8 to 10 feet of water. And the problem we ran into some of the other type diaphragm pumps, the cheaper ones, is they were built for shallow water applications. If you put them down below about 6 feet of water, the diaphragm would tear. We've had these on the market long enough to know now that they will work in deep water and they'll work in cold environments. So you can have things sitting outside in the weather. And that is also the advantage of going with a diaphragm type pump like this. Typically there is self-contained housing. You can set this on a paving block out in the, in the weather other than having a foot of snow over top of it. Those to handle the rain and, the, and snow and such as that and do just fine. Whereas a unit like this does need a housing to be put in. So you have to have this either inside a structure or at least some sort of a tub or a, or a roof over top of it to keep the rain off of it because it is an open electric motor. Both of them run off of 110 um, and they come in a variety of sizes. So what we typically handle is this double piston that's about 5 CFM and we have two different sizes of the diaphragm pump. One's around 3 CFM and the other is 5 CFM. Now, depending on which unit you run, you can run multiple stones. The uh, piston setup like this can run three air stones very effectively. And the way you do that is you come off of the end with a splitter valve and run your air lines out into your pond and then balance out the amount of air that goes to each stone because the stone that is, has the most resistance will take the least air. So you've got to balance that air, um, balance that air resistance out, so to speak, to make sure all the stones bubble equally. The other thing is when these things run in the wintertime, you want to make sure that nobody goes out in the ice because it will make a, a weak place where the air is, all these layers are going to be whole and close to the hole the ice is going to be thin. So we going to make sure this is a safety factor that nobody walks out or goes ice skating near these things when they're running. Now another air source is the diaphragms, uh, diaphragm pumps that we run with the windmills. This is a pump off of our windmills. We've got to also got a video on the windmill insulation and assembly. This is the unit that makes the air. This part sits on the tower, this is the pump itself, and then the fan fastens onto the shaft. And as the fan is turned with the wind, this shaft will turn, and if you can hear that, that's the diaphragm pulling air in and pushing air back out. And the air goes down through, it comes out that tube into an air line, and it goes into the air stone just like this. So we have the option of wind power or electric over air, whichever works best for the customer. The individuals are a long ways off from electric sources. It's a lot cheaper to go with the windmill because you don't have to run that electric cord and trench it in, pay for electric and all that kind of stuff. If you're real close to electric, then the offset between the price of the windmill and these little electric units, you know, a lot of times it's, it's cheaper to go that way. So it really depends on what your taste is. If you want to get off the grid entirely, these little units do a great job. If you don't mind using some electric, here again, set those things on a uh, set them on a timer and it doesn't really affect your electric bill that much. Bottom line is, bottom aeration will prevent winter kills, help knock the nutrients out to where your pond stays clear, help to eliminate that duckweed and water mill issue, and also if you use any kind of natural bacteria like we sell, that also makes more oxygen in the bottom of the pond, so bacteria are more aggressive, they break out black muck up, clean your pond up quicker. So, if you check out our website, at www.fendersfishhatchery.com. You'll find other videos on there. You'll find our information. Our website has my phone number and my email address in there. Give me a call, we'll help you out.